G'day everyone, Matt Elder of Family Bricks, and today I'm joined by Kaz Mockett. How are you going, Kaz? Hello, Matt. Very well, thank you. How are you? Excellent. Yeah, good, thank you. Great to have you here with us. Some have described Kaz as the queen of Micropolis and currently has models in the Lego house in Billund. I was actually meant to be going and seeing that this month, but due to COVID-19, we can't be able to do that. So I thought the next best thing, I'd get Kaz in to talk about them. Thank you. Well, I prefer the title Mayor of Micropolis because that's what my uh, my Lego user group friends tend to call me. Um, <laughs> but yes, Micropolis, what is it? Well, I can explain with here's one I built earlier. Um it's a collaborative standard which was invented about 10 years ago by the folks at Twinlug in the USA and it's based around a 16 by 16 Lego base plate um, and then you sandwich a plate, a brick and then your flat plate on top and the standard also defines that there are pinholes in the middle so that you can join them all together and it also says that you should have two sides um, in this uh, d design to, to be a road with a little crosswalk and uh, a pavement or sidewalk there. So that leaves you um, with a, a little alleyway around the back, which is always good practice to put in so that the buildings aren't butting up next to each other. And then you have a 12 by 12 um, area in the middle of the plate to do exactly what you like with. Uh, and I'm, I'm rather keen on classic space, so I built this one a while back. Uh, the standard also defines the vertical height. Now, if you've seen some of the Lego architecture sets, you'll know that they quite often do uh, a, a solid plate and then a transparent plate and then a solid plate and sandwich those to make a, a building. That's a little bit small for the Micropolis scale and it tends to be one brick plus one plate per floor for your average sort of uh, building. Sometimes you can go to two or possibly three bricks high if it's meant to be a big atrium in an office block, for instance, because real buildings aren't necessarily the same height as your average uh, sort of semi-detached low ceiling. So uh, there's a little bit of leeway, but if you always build to those specifications, you can always plug them together and make a much larger display, uh, either with yourself or with other people. So that's what I've been doing over the past mm, two and a half years, near about. Um, started in um, November 2017 and uh, can't really stop I keep building things <laughs> regularly <laughs> um, and I was very fortunate in that uh, a while back the Lego house got in touch with me and they said we've seen your work online we're really impressed um, would you like to come and display some of your micropolis in Lego house and frankly, I couldn't get to Denmark quick enough. So there we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because with that, I believe um, you actually went there to do the installation. Yes, that's correct. Um, uh, in September last year, the end of September, uh, I was uh, invited to Denmark to install my work. Um, the option was either fly and possibly end up with lots of tiny little pieces in a suitcase, which I decided not to do. <laughs> uh, so I decided to go on a road trip adventure. And uh, I drove myself from my home in Essex in, uh, in the UK all the way to Denmark, which took about two and a half, three days. Three days because I had to go to a Lego show on the way because, you know, I'd already said I was going to do that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it was great fun. And uh, we were treated like royalty by the folks at the Lego house. It was absolutely amazing. I met some incredibly talented folks over there as well who also come to put their work in from all over the world. So... It was an absolutely massive honour to have my work um, installed in Lego House uh, for people to see. Yep, yep. And since then, have you? What's the sort of feedback that you've gotten from um, either people who visited the house or just online? Oh, everything's uh, been generally pretty positive. Um, particularly people that I know that have gone to the house since my work was put in there, are all sort of tag me on Instagram and take pictures and say, "Hey, we're here. It's still there." So that's really lovely. Um, and uh, of the, um, let me just say, this is this is a quarter of a block. So one 16 by 16 plate is defined as a quarter of a micropolis block. And I have six blocks on display in Billund, um, which is effectively the equivalent of, of six uh, 32 by 32 base plates. So that's just a very small selection of the stuff I've built. Um, I've got, I think in total, about 74 base plates worth now scattered all over the house <laughs> some are packed away some on display um and so you know whenever i build something new i'll i'll put a little video out on my youtube channel um and do a, a little explanation of, of what the build is and there's always a little story to go with things as well i find when i'm building something it helps 
just to have an idea of the story in my head. Sometimes they come at the end when I've built it and I think, well, what can this be? But more often than not, for all my types of building, not just micro scale, I, I kind of think to myself, what's this building going to be before I make it? Because that helps in my head tell the story and defines the sort of things that I might put in that building, be it micro scale or, or minifig scale. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, we'll put links around the video to uh, your website. And certainly when you see your videos, you very much see that at the, and you discuss the ideas behind it and those sorts of things. So where do you get your inspiration from? Um, I, I've always enjoyed looking at um, real architecture in the real world. And uh, in fact, when I was in my early teens, I decided I wanted to be an architect. Um, and then I discovered how long it would take to train to do that and decided not to go down that path in the end. But I've still got a, an interest, an active interest in all sorts of architectural styles. Um, some of my favourites are the Art Deco period, 1920s and 30s. Um, so it's generally, for, for the um, even for the Micropolis, which a lot of it is very colourful and sort of fantastical rather than reality, um, there are still certain ways of building things, even if I might build it in a mad colour, that, that have been influenced from seeing things in the real world built. Yep, yep. And just picking up on that, you can see right behind, at the moment we've just had the, I can never pronounce it, the tenstricity craze? Tensegrity. 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 Oh, terrible yeah. me. Um, and yeah, definitely just over your shoulder there happens to be the one that you did for that. First one I built. And that was after Jason Allman had um, produced one in, in just regular grey. And I, I very rarely build things in just one colour because that's a bit dull, really. <laughs> so I got to my parts drawer and I got all the bits I needed. They just weren't all in the same colour. So I proved the principle and I posted a photo of that to my friends in my Lego user group. And they said, that's not good enough. You've got to build a Micropolis block. So uh, here, we, here we go. Tensegrity Heights is a very unstable, but just about works most of the time. <laughs> I wouldn't want to work in the top half, let's face it. Yeah, no. I decided to tell the story of this one is the um, uh, the anti-gravity research department at Micropolis University. So how they get up the top, never really explained, but they must manage it somehow. Well, they're and studying yes, anti-gravity, so I'm sure they've got their anti-gravity boots or something. Exactly. So this was this was featured on uh, the, the roundup that um, Beyond the Brick did a few few days ago, which was very nice. Yeah, because there were some amazing yeah. things in there and to have yours in there as well is just brilliant. So we'll put a, a link to that around the video as well. So given you've got the equivalent of about 72 base plates of all this Necropolis stuff and it's really quite diverse, mm -hmm. how did you sort of decide which ones were going into the Lego house? Did they sort of give you some hint pointers for that or do you just got free reign? Um, well, for starters, I was first approached in February last year, so I got considerably less than 74 blocks <laughs> to choose from. Um, so obviously I've built a lot since, uh, since what, what I was um, uh, first asked. Um, I think I went for things that were, I tried to represent things that were quite interesting and innovative in terms of parts usage, um, different styles but also have a little microcosm of kind of the downtown of Micropolis. So there's a, an overhead railway terminus, there's some trams, there's a, a little canal um, and high rise blocks and, and smaller uh, sort of dwellings as well. So um, university accommodation for students and that kind of thing to give a whole cross section of the sort of things that I build. Um, now I've always been a very keen student of colour, you know, how colour works together. Uh, and I've been a photographer for many years as well, so that plays in from that particular skill set. Um, and so basically I, went, I chose the ones that I thought were my best uh, builds, then put them together in a way that I found was pleasing, both sort of shape-wise and how the colours work together. And I sent the people at the, the Lego house um, a photograph of it, because they said, oh, you know, give us some initial um, ideas and we'll work with you to see if that works in the gallery. And so I was expecting some feedback saying, oh, well, perhaps you could move this one or, you know, have you got something to replace that one? I was like, that's fine, lovely. Please, please bring those. <laughs> so, yeah, in the end, it was quite a painless process. <laughs> so you didn't get to but the I end of it. I guess my previous experience of, of the photography and the way to, you know, if you're hanging an exhibition, for instance, you don't just plonk pictures next to each other. You make sure that they work 
together as a whole complete thing. So that was the kind of thing I was aiming at um, with uh, with the, that display. And indeed, it's a similar sort of thing that I do when I take my micropolis to shows because I always have the tallest things at the back, uh, partly to hide me <laughs> sitting there at the table, um, but also to then you know give some height at the back and people can then look up at a whole sweep of. Uh, what's going on in the um, in the town and see the smaller things at the front and gradually get enlarged. Okay, brilliant. So it wasn't okay. a matter of matter. after you submitted, it's like, oh, in the next revision, I'll get a chance to tweak this or that. It's just like, no, nope. here we go. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like to sort of, um, once you're there with all these other amazing builders and things and that, just hanging out with those guys and chatting and things? Oh, it was an re- absolutely amazing experience. Um, some of them I knew... You know, they've got YouTube channels or I follow them on Instagram. So I knew what they looked like and, and who they were effectively. Other folks I'd seen their work but didn't know them personally. Um, but, you know, it was really good to come together as a, a Lego community or be in a microcosm of, of the wider Lego community um, and just share ideas. And everybody was really, I think the, the strength of the Lego exhibition in the Masterpiece Gallery is that there's so many diverse styles. So... You know, I might be an expert at Micropolis or, or Microscale, but I can't build a Bionicle figure like some of those folks do. So the whole spectrum of building t- styles and techniques was really amazing. And that gave me a lot of inspiration to come home and do things with some of the parts that I kind of stuck in the rummage drawer and thought, I'm never going to use those. <laughs> and you think, oh, maybe I can. And so uh, it was interesting to try and use some parts that you think might not be uh, terribly useful. Yeah, well, you see that sometimes you get some parts, it's like, I don't really know what to do with that. And as what you're saying, you see somebody else doing it, it's like, oh, that's really clever. clever. Yes, particularly with microscale, people say, well, you don't need many pieces to make microscale stuff. Um, And I tend to think if they've got that idea that they've never tried to make microscale stuff, you do need lots of pieces, but you need lots of small pieces generally, smaller than... Um, you know, I don't often use pieces that are larger than maybe one by three brick or one by two even. Um, so it's a different kind of mindset. I, I build mini fixed scale things and I build smaller things as well. So my collection of parts is quite large and diverse, but I tend to find I go to one drawer for the smaller stuff for, for my crop list, whereas the, um, you know, the more unusual parts and the bigger parts that uh, you, you can't necessarily use very easily with Micropolis uh, get used for other things but sometimes you, you can be surprising I mean some I built something recently with a, a really large canopy from the um, uh, the Lego Movie 2 party bus and effectively that was just one piece uh, which was a quite large canopy anyway but when I used it in the Micropolis um, build I, I basically used it as a massive um, glass atrium on its end um, and then just put a few details in the in, underneath it so you can use larger pieces you just have to be a bit more um creative with how you actually end up putting them in the, in the build yeah definitely because then yeah, definitely, with then the larger pieces they really the want to stand out more so they need to be considered they have to be there for a good reason definitely yeah Yep. And so how did you initially go about developing your understanding for the micro, the, the Micropolis scale and how all the pieces fit and work together and develop, I guess, your design language? I came out of my dark ages in about October 2017, so not very long ago. Um, and I was searching around Flickr, I think mostly Flickr at that point because I've been on Flickr for years as a photographer um, before I discovered other places to find Lego photographs. And uh, I tried some microscale work, and it was terrible. The very first thing I built was called St. Bridget's Cathedral. And it was called that because St. Bridget was the patron saint of failure. <laughs> and actually, it was just awful. It was mostly because I basically got a classic brick box with lots of large, chunky pieces. And I was trying to represent something much smaller, and I didn't really have the right vocabulary of pieces, if you like, to put together what I wanted to. So some bridges is sadly now defunct, but there are photographs of it if you really want to see it. Um, <laughs> and then I stumbled across, oh, again, on Flickr, the um, Micropolis group, I think it was, and then looked at the website for the standard. And, and I did a lot of kind of visual research looking at lots of different people's builds, and that was really helpful because this thing's been going on at that point seven or eight years already. 
Um, so lots of people have done lots of uh, amazing builds. There are also some very good Micropolis videos when uh, people like Beyond the Brick go to a, a show in the US. They tend to do very large collaborative Micropolis displays there. So having seen some of those, I was kind of, you know, doing still frames and thinking, oh, that looks really interesting. What, what is it? And how do I do that? And so a lot of these things, I don't necessarily copy something, although I have been one or two things that I really like the design of. So I give full credit to the person that where I'm able to I, I put something together, maybe in a different colour scheme uh, for part of my Micropolis collection. But I look at something that somebody's built and think, oh, I'll try and do that myself. And then I find I haven't quite got the right parts, but it's enough of an idea and a seed of it, an idea to then me go in a slightly different direction to produce something else which is unique and, and original for myself. So that's, I think, looking at other people's work is really important. And that's, again, true with, you know, I've done that a lot with photography as well. So that kind of visual research can be really helpful. Yeah, just to get that initial basis and started. Um, and yeah. I'll also put another link to it because I've used it heavily. Uh, you've done a introduction to Macropolis building where you set out the standard and more or less yeah. elaborate a, a lot more on what you've already spoken about. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm not the first person to have done that, but it does get a lot of hits on my YouTube channel, so obviously people are watching it. And then I, from that initial one for just building the basic um, base plate, I've then gone on to do a whole series of things about uh, you know what, what are the best things to, to use for windows and using colour and repetition and all sorts of things that I kind of do without thinking about it because I've been doing repetition and styling patterns and things in photography and all sorts of stuff for, for, throughout my creative life, really. So I have to sort of step back a little bit and think, why did I do that? And then try and explain it in, in the, in the how-to videos for Micropolis. So I think there's about six or seven at the moment with one or two more in the works, uh, hopefully soon. Um, but gives you some ideas if you want to start building Micropolis, where to go, or where to begin. Some people send me a, a message and say, oh, you know, are you going to put instructions out for so and so? And my answer to that, I'm afraid, is always no. Partly because it takes a very long time to make instructions for things. Most of the time, I don't design things digitally first, so I'm just literally playing with the bricks. And it would mean me taking things apart to figure out how I did it, for instance, or you know exactly which brick attaches to what what brick. Um, but also, I think just building the thing that somebody else has built is not a way to learn. Uh, well, it's partly a way to learn in that you can get techniques, but um, there are plenty of how-to videos about, you know, building on with studs on the side and all this sort of thing. So I'm trying to give, with my tutorials and my corpus, some ideas that you can then go and build your own something that is unique to you rather than just sitting there and building what I've built in a different colour. Yeah, yeah, certainly having yeah. done some yeah. instruction yeah. creation, yeah. there's a whole yeah. art yeah. and there's a rabbit hole you can go down with that. So, <laughs> yeah, no. I just don't have time to build what I want, then I learn to do instructions. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, definitely, with that. So just going back a bit, you were saying before when um, you actually went to the Lego house and put your models in there that they, you know, treated you really well. Was there any sort of behind the scenes that you got to see or anything like of that nature? Um, we had a very nice guided tour of uh, the whole um, experience, really. I suppose it was a kind of experience plus, so you'd see what you'd see as a general punter if you bought a ticket, but we had guides who were basically, you know, they're the people that put the thing together, so they know it backwards, and there were some good anecdotes and things from um, from Stuart to Harris and, and Mike Ganderton, who was um, very good at looking after us as well. Um, but we didn't, unfortunately, get to see things like the, um, the Lego factory or, or indeed the vault, which was a bit disappointing. But, you know, there was only so much time and that would have taken most of the day, I suspect, anyway. So uh, maybe another time, who knows? <laughs> yeah, another time. Maybe on the next maybe next round that you get selected for something. something. Possibly, yes. So just on the back of that, do you have any sort of um, tips or anything for anyone who might be trying to get their stuff into the house, how to get noticed, what they should be doing, anything you picked up from the other guys that were there? Um, well, my uh, good fortune came through the London Adult Fans of Lego. Uh, Richard Selby, who was a um, glorious leader, as we like to call him, uh, put a message out to um, the members on our Slack discussion forum about the end of January, I think it was, last year, saying that the LEGO Ambassador Network, uh, which is run by LEGO, 
I put out a general call for would anybody like to show some work um, that might be considered for going in the Lego house. And I, I hadn't considered it at all, and I basically didn't didn't send him anything. And then just before the deadline came, Richard said, are you sure, you know, you haven't got anything to show us? You know, I could send it off. And I thought, oh, well, you know, why not? In for a punt. So I put together um, an album of what I thought were my best Micropolis models on Flickr, sent Richard the link, and he sent that off to uh, the good folks in Billund. Um, and sort of six weeks, two months went by, and I didn't hear anything. I thought, oh, well, that's the end of that then. Um, but sure enough, I think mid, mid March it was something like that. I got an email that I could hardly believe. <laughs> I read it several times saying, Would you like to come in and in, uh, display in the house? So, you know, that route through the, um, the Lego ambassadors and the, the Lego lugs is definitely one that's very common from getting work in the house. Uh, I believe also they. Um, the folk do travel to various shows around the country and around the world when they can to look at work that might be possible. And I know that um, the brilliant Coral Reef by uh, Ryan Van Duzel, which is also in the house, I think Stuart saw that at a show in the States and it won best in show at that show. So, you know, he's was, was definitely a worthy winner uh, and worthy to be included. So basically get your work out there. Um, I don't know whether Instagram is a good place or not because it's harder, I find. I mean, I, I do use Instagram now. I didn't to begin with, but I find it's harder to curate um, your own work in, say, an album or yeah. um, you know, have work that's one body of work. It's just a, a big stream and that's it. Whereas Flickr, you can put things in albums and caption things properly. And Maybe I'm just a, an old-school Flickr pro because I've been there, on there since... 2006 or something but you know i just find flickers easier to organize things from that perspective and then you give out one link for the album and that's it you don't need to do anything else and people see them in the order that you want them to see them uh rather than having to dig, dig around the timeline and find things themselves yeah so it's much like the old school cds where they were put into an order for a reason as you say because it was curated and that's an interesting comparison because i've always been aware of Flickr, but never really put anything on there because initially i just found those problems just giving out these long links and things but certainly take your point in terms of instagram it's it, instagram's more like a stream of conscious it's how you put things out yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah i've certainly heard um that a lot of the time it being selected comes from recommendations and things. How have you found that? Yes, I mean, that's that's the truth with people I've spoken to who are also displaying at the moment. They've said, you know, they've done it either through uh, somebody, you knows somebody at Lego and they put something forward or more likely they're the Lego ambassador uh, who has, you know, if you get it, if you, if you work for Lego and you get a random email from somebody saying, look at this stuff, you might not do that, but if you have a Lego ambassador saying this is one of my, my members work and that this is, they produce really good stuff, that's much more of a personal recommendation and they'll go and take notice of them. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, for our, we're part of the London AFOL group and for ours, we have Richard, which I did an interview, which we'll include in a link around here. So I can give you a bit of an idea of how, how that dynamic all works and fits together. So, okay. Then you mentioned that you've come out of your dark age recently. What was prior to that, your sort of experience with Lego? Or how did you grow up with it? I definitely had Lego when I was a child, um, uh, tribe of the mid seventies and early eighties. I would say with my prime Lego era, um, so I remember, I kind of remember, not at the time, but sort of subsequently, I definitely had some of the homemaker sets where they, there was really big figures with enormous bulbous heads. But I think the set that we, the sets that really caught my attention were the classic space stuff in 1979. And I remember wanting absolutely all of those things uh, from the catalogue. And, you know, the catalogue was so dogged and dreadful by the end of the year that I did get some of them, I get all of them, but... Uh, yeah, the classic space stuff was was really what I was um, into at that point. Although I had basic bricks as well. Um, and myself and my, my best friend from next door, who was a couple of years older than me, used to play a game called Contraptions, uh, where we would go into one or other of his houses and um, tip all the Lego out the floor, you know, wheels, pieces, goodness knows what. And we would build a contraption, which was usually very, very narrow, very, very long, very, very tall. 
and then we would try and see, we push them down the, the lounge and see which one collapsed first, basically. <laughs> which I do remember was great fun. Um, but these things, the more teetering and perilous they were, the better, basically. And the, the more likely they were to just fall apart and, you know, or just need to add this piece and it would just explode on you. So that was good fun. Um, I'm tempted, actually, to, to suggest something similar for one of our London Apples challenge nights, but I don't know how well it'll go down. Um, but then inevitably in my mid-teens, um, I got into other things and decided that Lego wasn't for me anymore, and I sold it. And my 40-something self kicked me, oh. so, sort of 30 years later. <laughs> so uh, I think 2017, sort of mid Autumn, autumn and early winter is when I got back into Lego. Um, and I, I very remember see I mean, prior to that, I'd had one or two things that I bought myself, like the Space Shuttle in 2012 and the Saturn V, because I'm a mad space geek as well, I always have been. Um, and uh, so that, that I, I bought those for myself, but I didn't consider myself an adult fan of Lego. I didn't know that was a thing. I just had these things that were Lego. Um, and then it wasn't really until I went to an exhibition um, by Richard Carter, who was chairman of the Brick Alley Lug in the Northeast. Um, he'd got an exhibition called Little Landmarks, where he'd made various 12 or so landmarks from, from South Shields area, which is where he lives um, in the area, and, and they're in the South Shields Museum. And then I was kind of like, oh, people build things that aren't from sets. And I don't know why... The, the idea that people mock with Lego is something that hadn't really occurred to me because, you know, when I built my contraptions, they were exactly that. They were my own creation, but they were terrible and they didn't last very long. So maybe I thought they were just ephemeral things and not something to be built and kept together as a, you know, starting to build a city or some representing real things. Um, so I went to that and I was really impressed. And then um, a few days later, I was on my way to uh, Manchester for a conference. And I was a bit early and decided to nip into the Lego store in the Arndale Centre. Um, and it's been downhill from there ever since, really. I bought the uh, Berlin Architecture Skyline set. And I, that's, the, that's the set that I really think to myself, that's my first Affol purchase as an adult fan of Lego, as I thought of it myself. So, yeah. Yeah, it's certainly interesting how we just did things and it's only subsequently later later we put labels back on it, whether it's sort of like, oh, it's a my own creation. It's like, well, I was always making stuff and pulling apart and doing other things or, yeah, sort of like, oh, okay, yeah, you're just interested. And then, oh, you, as an adult, you must be an asshole then. And then it's, yeah. Well, it's even more strange, really, because I've got a friend up in Leeds who has had lots of Lego for many years of his adult life. Um, and to begin with, I just thought, well, that's a bit weird. Why would people do that? But <laughs> uh, sorry, Dom. I know, I know what the thing is now. I get it. <laughs> get it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's now taken over. Yeah. In addition to the Micropolis that you're quite well known for, um, as you can see right behind you, you also do extensively habitats and also uh, the brickheads. Um, I just wonder if you want to comment a little bit on the habitats because the way that you actually use them is actually really uh, quite a nice idea. Well, someone asked me about my style of building in a previous interview and I decided, I thought about it for a little bit and I decided that I work best when I have restrictions. So if you give me a blank piece of baseboard and say build something, um, there's just too many possibilities and my head explodes. But give me a restriction. There's a micropolis base plate. You've got to obey certain rules to make it into a micropolis thing. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, okay, I know where my boundaries are now, but I can still be creative within that and you know, produce something interesting, hopefully. Well, there's another little um, uh, standard here called Habitats. Now, I originally saw it from a post on Instagram by uh, Rambling Brick, and I credited them with the invention of it in fact when i did a video and they, they got in touch and said no no it wasn't me i i found that somebody in singapore had them so I mean, somewhere around east asia somewhere uh, this was invented um and it's basically a, a little habitat a little way of having a um a, a small scene mostly for minifigs uh that is an interlocking system again so you you base it on an eight by eight plate and then you build four bricks tall with this side sticking out 
but flush on that side. And then four bricks the other way around, so that that's flush with the edge and this is sticking out. And then the, the tiles and plates in a certain way on the top there. So that gives you your basic habitat. And again, if you stick to that format of making sure those heights are correct, um, you can do whatever you like in the middle with whatever minifig you like. And uh, they will stack together to make an amazing display. Um, now, I'm by no means the only person to have done this. Again, I, I did some, when I first found this, I, I was interested and in, found some uh, videos and pictures online. Um, and I think there was a big display, over a thousand of them in, uh, I think, Perth or something like that, that somebody got on, on YouTube. So that was interesting to look at. Um, but this is the very first one I started with, the, um, the series uh, Fox. Oh wow! And then I thought, well, you've got to have the fox and grain conundrum, haven't you? The fox, <laughs> the grain, and the chicken crossing the bridge. So that was my very first one. Now, I've, I've quite enjoyed collecting minifigs over the years. I had, I'd started in 2010 when they first came out, but I don't buy everything. I don't insist on having everything from one series. So I just buy the ones that I find interesting. Um, but they sit there, and sometimes they're suitable for going in my Lego city, and sometimes they're very much not. Uh, in fact, you know, to such an extent, I decided I was going to have a, a costume parade in the high street because otherwise people in, in an alien costume would never see the light of day, pretty much. So um, building these, though, gives you the chance to pick the ones that you really, really like and do something interesting for that particular character. And um, eight by eight is not much, but actually you can, you can cram quite a lot in that space yeah. if you're uh, careful and, and, you know, you... you do things like hide things in the walls so one thing they do specify is um the, the two bricks right at the edge have to be flush because otherwise they don't fit together but if you really have to you can build things out the back as well and then make maybe an arch or something in, in the front so that this gives a little bit more depth but you have to be quite careful to make sure that you're not then um you can't fit it together with another block if that's what you want to do um I know Steve Guinness, one of the first Lego Master winners in the UK, has been making these for all of the minifigs. Uh, started at series, I think he started with 18, but now he's gone back and he's doing one, two, three, and whatever. So on his Instagram, there are photos of enormous triangles of stacked habitats for each series, which are really good to, to see as well. So have a look at those if you can, if you can find them. Yeah, no, I, I've certainly seen them, and as what you say, they're ginormous, and he's literally doing it for every single one. And he's just recently started doing some tutorials where you basically are able to put like little gears and mechanisms in them for like an Olympic series, which, given the Olympics, was delayed now by a year or so. Um, so it certainly, yeah. as what you're saying, there's different ways that you can then extend off the idea. And you can certainly see, even with that first one that you got there, in terms of you know your sense of color and everything, which is coming through the way that you got the degradation in the back. And yeah, certainly you see that you're drawing on a, a very artistic skill set to pull that together. Yes, thank you. I mean, quite often I'll build, I'll look at the minifig, and you probably can't see it terribly well, but Spider Man's the classic example there. He's red and he's blue, so I just got all the red and blue bricks that I got, and all the parts that I could find, chucked them on the table and started building. And that was the that was the driver for his um, little habitat was go with the colours because then that emphasises what he is and what he looks like. Now I could just have built a sort of grey and dark grey building that he was swinging off, and that would have been fine. But they, for me, that wasn't exciting enough and wasn't colourful enough certainly so I'm always a sucker for putting in colours that most people would just use as paper. Yeah, because you can certainly see even in the uh, with that sitting in the background you can't see the details but what you can see is just those pops of colour and the way that you've got them yeah. you know, in their bands and we'll have a it, later, so huh? Just off the other side of that is your Brickheads collection. Just wondering if you can uh, talk to that. And obviously, it started somewhere, and it's it's grown a lot too. Yes, the Brickheads. They're a funny uh, series. Really. I didn't see the point of them. Uh, partly because the first two or three waves were all DC minifigs or Marvel or whatever. And I'm not a comic person. Never have been. Don't. I mean, there's nothing wrong with them, but they don't appeal to me personally. So um, a lot of these characters, for starters, I didn't know who they were. Um, and also, well, it was like, well, fair enough. And then there were some Star Wars ones, which were, I, I knew who most of those characters were. 
um, but not all of them again. Uh, and then I can't remember which one that I bought and built, built it. And I thought, actually, this is fun. I quite like this. So it's one of the few lines that I am trying to do as much as possible to complete. Um, I'm never going to get there because I know for sure that I really want them way beyond exclusives in this state. Maybe two characters, particularly Benny and um, Sweet May, which I'm a bit gutted I can't find, but hey ho, you know, several hundred or more, so it's not going to happen. But uh, genuinely, most of the most of the more common ones, I think I'm missing about three or four sets at the moment um, from the ones that most people can get hold of. So uh, I'm getting there. There's still a little bit of room on the shelf for expansion. And I built one or two custom ones as well, uh, mostly from uh, the, the uh, BBC sci-fi drama, comedy drama, Red Dwarf, which I really enjoy. So I built the four main characters from that. Um, but it's not something I don't, I don't think I'm going to be going further down that line in terms of mock, mocks of my own, because lots of people have done them probably better than I would. And I, it's probably because I just haven't had an idea of all if that's a character that I've not been doing before and I want to do. So I might do the odd one or two if something crops up, but at the moment it's not something that's highly doing. Yeah, it, it becomes, a, as what you say, other people, when they're into different uh, licensed properties and things, they're fully into it and, you know, they will just do it and do it super well. The other thing which you also do, just to add something else into the mix, is you've got a pretty extensive uh, Lego city as well. Yes, uh, Blockville is my city, um, to go with Blockhead UK, which is my online Lego identity. Um, and I started building um, about 18 months ago, no, 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 two years ago probably now. Um, no, I haven't got a huge space. This room is where most of it is, slash was. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and it's about six foot by eight foot, including a whole meter city and then parts drawers here. So. It's sort of a six foot by four foot square and then another spur off the side, which is effectively the bit I'm looking at now. Um, and I like I like the modular buildings. I don't have all of them by any means, but I've, I've managed to acquire the ones I really enjoy. Uh, and I've built a, a split level um, sort of modular area there. And then uh, I built a little um, a theme park, amusement park, and had a few bits of residential buildings and whatnot. And I had a classic monorail. Now, the classic monorail was something that, until I became an adult fan of Lego, I didn't know existed because I was well into my dark ages by the time that came along. Never seen it, never heard of it, really. I saw the monorail and thought, oh, I'd really like some of that. Um, although I wasn't mad keen on any of the sets in terms of I need to buy the whole set, but I really liked the concept, the, uh, the track and the, the drive train and the rest of it. So I bought some pieces, basically did a, um, various trawls on eBay mostly uh, to buy the chassis and the motor uh, so that goes together in three pieces and lots of track. And actually that's, that's turned out probably cheaper than trying to buy any one single set complete. Mm. Because, well, I say cheaper. E each individual bit has been cheaper, but over the course of <laughs> however many times I've been buying it, uh, it's not quite as cheap. But I've got lots of track, um, and I really enjoy having that, that stuff going around. Also, a little train loop as well to go uh, underneath uh, the raised part of the city and then across the front. Um, but things have got very, very dusty and a little bit, a little bit stale in terms of what I enjoy building. Um, and in the meantime, sort of early last year, I started really mocking and building things to do with to go with my Ninjago city and the docks. Now again, I'd seen video online of um, the Brothers Brick, I believe it was, did a, a call out for a collaborative Ninjago district uh, at one of the big shows in the States and Beyond the Brick did a really good video of a whole tour of this thing. And whilst I'd sort of thought about it in principle before that, I never actually thought, oh, you know, that could go, that could work really well. And once again, there was a standard, an informal standard at this point. That the Brothers Brick put out a standard that said, if you build this this base plate with the, the, the height of the um, the upper walkway in a certain place, and three studs at the front, eight at the back, all the rest of it for the water, 
you join them up with anybody else's. So that standard, again, piqued my interest, and uh, I decided to start building that in January last year. And uh, it's now the thing I enjoy building the most. So I think what's happening, going to happen, is uh, the city's gradually, the rest of the city's gradually been um, taken apart. Mostly the, uh, the amusement park and the residential bit. I've still got the dusty modulars just over there, which I need to clean. And I won't take those apart because I do really love them. But uh, I'm, it's going to be a very much smaller conventional city in my in my house, really. And then try and build more of the Ninjago stuff. Uh, so we'll have to figure out where that's going. But currently what I've got amounts to six and a half by four and a half base plates, three and a half base plates, I think, with some water in the middle, with dot box area in the middle, uh, which is on a trolley downstairs in the lounge with lots of other stuff moved out of the way. Um, but uh, I've filled that now and I'm still building. <laughs> but that's what I was doing before I, I was supposed to be talking to you. So, uh, yeah. Cause it, <laughs> it's a compulsion. From the photographs and that, it's gorgeous because you've got gorgeous. particularly, um, I think you've taken some of the, the uh, Chinese New Year sets from this year and you know, put those together and just do you just want to comment on how you sort of mixing I guess the the Lego type sets with your own mocks. Yeah, sure. The, the I think the um the one thing that struck me about Ninjago City, the official set, was the diversity of techniques and styles that were all sort of mashed together but they really worked. You know, they still they were like some crazy microcosm of a, a really busy city and I loved it. And so you know, building one thing on a 32 by 32 base plate is quite a quite an undertaking in terms of the number of bricks you need and um, the way you have to think about putting all the floors together and all the rest of it. And whilst I have built a couple of modulars, they've both only been 32 by 16, so half, half base plates. Um, but they do take a lot of bricks of the same colour, you know, to, to make a whole facade of, of a two or three storey building. Um, but the Ninjago stuff, I find, you can make something, it's a bit like making a habitat, but with four walls. So there's far fewer bricks required. All of them are detailed inside, so I always detail the interior because I, I love that as well. Even though nobody but me can see them, or you can see them when you, I do a video, but um, I always try and cram as much in as possible. Um, and I think that's, that's a skill that's been learnt um, initially from... Uh, JC of Small Brick City, uh, which is another YouTube channel, where he builds things in very small areas um, and, and crammed all the detail in, and it looks amazing. So that was definitely worth a watch if you want to see how to, to really detail interiors which are really small. Um, but then it means that I can mix and match things that most people would think, well, they won't go together, will they? But I try it and I think, well, actually, that looks quite fun. And it's in that style. Now, there are many parts that I've had in my rummage drawer, my God knows what I'm going to do with it drawer, uh, for quite some time that I've occasionally dug through and went, oh, yeah, I could use that for Ninjago City or Ninjago District. And I've used an awful lot of really weird parts for that. But it does look amazing when you can find a decent use for them in that sort of mad, eclectic, let's put anything together, see what happens way. Um, so I use things from, I've used sets from Hidden Side, the Shrimp Shack and the Diner, uh, sorry, the same thing, uh, the Shrimp Shack and the Boat uh, and the Lighthouse, which I really enjoyed. All of those are, are now on my YouTube channel to have a, a good look round. So not only do I do an overview of, of the Ninjago area from time to time, but I'll also do a full um, uh, look at each mock that I built. I haven't quite finished doing all, all of them yet, but they're all in the pipeline, so to speak. Um, but also, I really love the uh, the Chinese New Year sets, both from this year and last year. Um, I was fortunate enough that a friend of mine was going to Japan last year, uh, back to visit his family, I managed to find all three of the really hard to get ones uh, at retail, or Japanese retail cart price, and brought them back in carrier bags in his suitcase for me. So I, learned, I don't have the boxes for those. Um, I don't generally keep boxes, so it's not much of a problem. But yeah. uh, you know that I got them at a reasonable price. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've now integrated them into 
various areas of the, uh, of the Njogo district that I've got. Um, Chinese New Year dinner celebration, I put a, a fourth wall on that, and that was the ground floor of uh, one of my biggest blocks. Um, uh, I made an amazing Chinese restaurant. And then the, uh, the dragon dance is on a pier, and the dragons are sort of going up and down. It looks like there's a, a dragon display going there. And also, of course, the, the, um, the boat race. I've, I've made just about enough room in the docks for the boat race. It's a bit, a little bit congested, but that's what Ninjago City is like. But then I also put things in that are from friend sets or um, sometimes Disney or whatever. Uh, anything that I, look, I think looks interesting and colourful, if I can find it cheap, uh, I'll often buy something like a Disney Princess Castle set cheap because it's got some really nice pieces in it. I'm not interested in the mini doll at all. Um, and I don't want to keep it together, but I build it once just to see how it looks together. And then I put the parts in the drawers and, and out they come sometime later and, and resurrect themselves as something completely different. Sometimes that's my cropolis, sometimes it's part of Ninjago City, sometimes it's part of a habitat, so it all depends on or and I think no, I was, I was gonna say I put some trolls in, but no, I've made some habitats for trolls, so that's a very weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's certainly I, I can see from Lego, you know, they're always trying certain things and you, you sometimes look and go, okay, yeah, I, I get that you're trying, but yeah, not for me. Exactly. So, the other thing which I, I think I've heard you mention in the past that works really well with the Ninjago City and that you're really doing is you're taking it up. Just wondering if you can comment on that a little bit more. Yes, not having much area uh, to develop where Lego City can be a trial, as many people will know. And one thing that people do if they want, you know, they want trains and they want modulars is they'll run a tunnel underneath the modulars so they can elevate things in the rear and you can see them better. And then there's some you can still run the train underneath without having to take even more room. Obviously, there's no trains in Ninjago City, uh, although I do have a little monorail system that I've built from roller coaster tracks and the little roller coaster carriages. It's not powered, but you know, it's, it's not even a loop, it's just station to station. But it does go above the docks, uh, above the water. And uh, so going up is one thing that definitely appealed to, um, to me about the Ninjago City set, because it's only one base plate, but it's the equivalent of height of two, or th well, two modulars at least, really, um, all in you know, crazy different heights and, and features and whatnot. Um, so going up is a really good way of maximising the space that you've got. Um, so much so that I decided to add three levels to one, one to each of the separate sections of the Ninjago City docks to give me some more things to, to put in as well. Um, and then the modules, the, 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 the um, Ninjago mocks that I've made myself have tended to be two to three levels, big levels generally. Um, sometimes there's a roof garden as well or something else on the roof interesting like a blue platform so that gives you an awful lot more scope if you're using the vertical space as well as going outwards uh, many people don't have the real estate to do that so going up is a good thing yep yep and just in general if anyone's watching and thinking about starting their own sort of lego city what sort of tips would you have in terms of you know try to think of this first or how you plan it out or anything you can comment on I think if you want trains, you have to lay them out first and everything has to work around the trains because you'd be surprised. Trains take up a lot of room. Yeah. You cannot do a uh, 180 degree turn in less than three base plates deep with a train. No, it can't be done. Monorail's better because, well, the old monorail's better because that's only two. You can do a complete 180 turn in, in just two base plates, but you've got to plan where your railway's going and I think it's one thing that when I when I resurrect and finish dusting all the modulars, I might well have a bit of railway, but it may not even be a complete loop. It might just be something to display the train that I like the best, which is the um, Horizon Express. Uh, and and then you know one thing you don't have to do is have to run. if you want to run a train, it's best to have a complete loop. But if you just if you're really tight for space and you just want to have a diorama if you like you don't have to have a complete loop you could just have straight train track at the front for instance and you know put your 
put all your detailing into that at the front, but then have some depth further on. Well, that means then you, you've only got eight studs that you've got to think about for depth, not three base plates worth. So um, if you can decide that you, you don't necessarily want to run things around, I mean, one, maybe have have some track you can put out on the floor and run it around when you want to play. Um, but if you want to just do the detailing and really build the city um, in a very short, very tight space, then I'd suggest probably only a straighter track would be the way to go with that. Otherwise, um, I don't have any roads in my city. Again, I'm not mad keen on cars anyway. Um, and the split level that I got was pedestrianised only. And although there were one or two small roads in the um, uh, residential area, which is now packed in a box, um, they were only very narrow cars. So, you know, if you could do without roads and just make an old town which is pedestrianised, maybe then, again, you, you save yourself having to use up valuable space for something that's just effectively flat um, and you can then possibly use it for something a bit more interesting. Um, I mean, one example would be the, the Diner um, modular came with a lovely pink Cadillac and I love it as a car. So I decided to put it on the roof as a 3D sign uh, and that works fine. You know, there's a recording studio and I call it Pink Cadillac Studios. That's their, their sign that's on the roof. Uh, so you don't always have to have vehicles around. Um, got one or two helicopters kicking them out, but um, yeah, the, certainly you need to get that infrastructure sorted out first. And also, I think Jan's been talking a lot about think about sight lines. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you have got the luxury of having a reasonable amount of space, you might want one long road. Um, you know, with things facing each other, but put something at the end of it so that when you're looking down that road in that direction, the eye's got something to, to rest on at the end. Um, and similarly, somebody like Mr. Bookie Boo, who does really good layered city, um, he's got roads that are going parallel with the edge of his table, but they'll take a right turn or whatever, and then they'll head off into a, um, an arch that's effectively a tunnel. Now, you, you don't see what's in the tunnel because that's where the wall is, but if you can put things around the edge of the city um, to enhance things as, as facades, maybe two or three studs deep. Um, and again, another channel that does this really, really well is Wobbing Hood Bricks. So I really enjoy their um, build and their content. And he's got um, facades around the outside of his city so that it looks like there's more, even though that facade might only be four bricks deep you know, the other side of his train track loop. There is something against the wall rather than just it being whatever colour your wall is. So try and think about depth, try and think about when you're looking down the road, what happens at the end of it. Um, and again, sometimes this is luxury if you haven't got the room, but uh, if you have, then you can think about those sort of uh, things when you're planning your city. Yeah, so it's very much like the old Hollywood back lots and sort of things like, you know, off in the distance, you there's it just doesn't end on like a field or something random. It's actually, no, there's a timber facade or, as you're saying, there's a, a, a turn into a tunnel or, or something to disguise the fact that there's a wall there. Absolutely. You can do a lot of cheating and a lot of um, su visual suggestion, actually, by, by taking some leaf out of the, you know, the, the Hollywood movie. Uh, a book from that perspective definitely yeah okay. and if nothing else buy yourself a big sheet that's got clouds printed on it or something it's more interesting than looking at the wall so yeah, yeah i've seen a couple of um, people who've done even for mocks and things like that like they might be quite long and things and they've just got a printed mm -hmm. backdrop and it might just have some basic colors but it's just enough that um yeah it, it's one of those things if it's not there you notice it but if it's there it's sort of like it sits into the background and so we'll get into the, the rapid fire questions just to get a, a bit more in the background. What's your favorite set? Uh, I'm wearing it. 928, the Galaxy Explorer. Well, oh, I'm wearing uh, Blueprint. <laughs> the, one of the very big space sets. I never had it as a child, but it was one of the first things that I decided I wanted to buy myself when I decided I was an Apple. And I do now own it, yeah. Lovely set. Have you ever, I know there's some of the guys in the lug who do the updates to the classic space stuff. Have you ever thought of doing any of those? I've done updates to 918 and 924, the two smaller ones. I uh, haven't got round to the big yet. Maybe, eventually, but don't know. It's, there. It, it, it's 
in the, filed away in the back of your mind then. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, favorite theme? Uh, I think probably architecture. The, um, the, the architecture range has got some really beautiful buildings in it. I don't like all of them, but, you know, we like all of everything. So, uh, yeah, architecture, I think, is probably the way to go for that. Okay. Yep, great. A theme you didn't like, never understood, glad that they don't make it anymore. Uh, never understood Galador. Lots of people deride Galador, and uh, I think they're probably right. <laughs> um, another one I didn't really understand, again, probably because I was deep in my dark age at the time, is Bionicle. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the people do do some incredible builds, figure builds and animal builds and all sorts of stuff with Bionicle parts. My head is just not in that space at all. I can't get my head around Bionicle. But it's kind of a very odd mixture of, well, I don't think there's not even much system going on. It's, it's more like technique with, with panels and stuff. So uh, not really into Bionicle. Partly because I didn't watch any of the shows or I was never into the character characters either, so that doesn't help. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's too different system, really, for my, my head to get around. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay. Then that feeds into the next one. Um, do you like Technic or not? I have a love-hate relationship with Technic. I don't generally like building with Technic, but it's a necessary evil for great ball contraption, which is another thing I do uh, to get things moving and gears and all the rest of it. Um, I've only ever bought one Technic set in my life. It was a biggie. It was the Bucket Wiglet, Bucket Wheel Excavator. Uh, and I bought that at the advice of some friends from my Lego user group when I said, what's a good parts pack for GPC? And I managed to find it at a very good price because somebody had one that the box was completely wrecked and all the pieces were fine. So I got that cheap. Uh, I built it. God, it hurt my fingers. Um, I didn't enjoy building it really. I didn't enjoy taking it apart. But I've now got a very large collection of Technic bits. And every now and then I'll you know, buy a few odds and ends off Brickling or something. But it's generally, I need this gear to do this GBC rather than, oh, let's go and buy a set and build it and see what, see what, what with it. Um, it's also one of the reasons why I generally tend to build my GBC modules from somebody else's plans. Because although I'm an engineer, I'm not an uh, I'm not a mechanical engineer, I'm an electronic engineer, and so I don't have that innate feel about gearboxes and how they work. Uh, and therefore, I could put something together if someone tells me how. But thinking, oh, I need to step down that gear ratio a bit, but oh, can't. So that's why, with one or two exceptions, most of my GBC are built from other people's plans. Plans. Yeah, the, there is certainly a different mind space for that, and much the same. I think the uh, the bucket wheel excavator is probably the ultimate Technics parts pack. <laughs> it's a beast for sure. <laughs> okay, um, and this might be a hard one. Any mock that you've done that you're really proud of? Uh, well, I thought about this, and it really it's got to be the ones that are on display in, in the Lego house because uh, that's the ultimate accolade really um so yes those micropolis buildings that are in the house although having said that since they've been in there i've built some micropolis modules that i think personally are better and more interesting but you know they weren't in existence when they were put in the house so yeah, yeah they were your better ones that you had at the time and how much space do you have for lego do you have a, a table a, a room a house uh, I think the honest answer is probably a house. I have the luxury of living on my own and can do what I like, so that's that's uh, not constantly somebody going, oh, I'm tripping over your Lego again. Occasionally I think to myself, oh, I'm tripping over your Lego again, but not very often. Um, so the room I'm in now is, is the Lego room, uh, which is about, as I said, six foot by ten foot, mostly tables, but um, my parts drawers are here as well. Uh, and then most of the Micropolis lives on um, Ikea lac shelves, which are exactly the right width for a 32 by 32 base plate, fortunately. And I've got a whole section of those up in, in my lounge where I just put the ones that are most recent or most interesting. Uh, the rest go in a, in a really useful box and get put under the bed or wherever I can find somewhere to hide them. Um, and then again, there's, there's a, a quite a large trolley in the downstairs with the all my Ninjago stuff on it. Um, so... There is another room in the house that hasn't got any Lego in it yet, but I'm 
haven't quite worked my way in there. <laughs> yeah, it's off limits at this stage. Off limits at this stage. Uh, it is on the long term projects list, I have to confess. So, yeah, maybe. It, it's an office that I don't use much as an office now, so it might as well be another Lego room. <laughs> another Lego room. So it's not like the, the Lego equivalent of uh, green belt that will never be built on. <laughs> no, that's my bedroom. I'm, I'm not going to put Lego in there. <laughs> you wake up and yeah, just see that all the time. <laughs> well, it's the biggest room in the house, actually. It's a, it's a good 15 by 12 or something. It's a nice room, but I need somewhere that I can go. There's just no stuff <laughs> apart <laughs> from the bed and the few drawers. <laughs> Yeah, that, that stimulation overload that you can get from everything else. <laughs> Just yeah. need to... It's also a bit dusted, frankly. Roughly, how many Lego pieces do you think you have? I had no idea until I went to Brickset. And Brickset said, of the sets that I've got, so I always put down if I've bought a set and how many I've got, um, it said about 140,000 pieces. However, that's just the sets I've got. Yeah. And it takes absolutely no account of all the trips to the pick a brick wall and play brick boxes and brilliant orders and everything else. And the fact that for my crop list, you need a lot of very small pieces. So I would say easily double it to 300,000. It might even be as high as 500,000. I don't know, to be honest. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to sit and count <laughs> Because, well, yeah, certainly it's those things with the modules, you start going, okay, well, there's a couple thousand there, a couple thousand there. And then if you built up and done this and everything, and sort of like... How many pieces are in a mock? I haven't got a clue. Not a clue, not a Scooby. It's not really something that interests me as a metric, so I just got, I just build it and that's fine. I don't yeah. really care. So I yeah. don't tend to think, oh, well, that floor's got 50 pieces in it and this one's got another 50. <laughs> You don't want to scare yourself with the number of pieces then. <laughs> yes, I'm the runner. Um, and what's the uh, theme that you wish they'd bring back? My favourite old theme, I think, is Classic Space. The, the original, uh, this colour scheme, Classic Space. The blue and the green. Now, anything that's got white in it or silly other co transparent colours, I'm not so keen on. Um, but that's just me being an old codger, really. Uh, so... I, I mean, they, they made a good attempt with the, the space sets from last year, which I thought were reasonably well done and, and nicely um, updated for the 21st century, but more space. Yeah. And your favourite Lego build of the last year? Oh, the last year. That's a tough one. Uh, I was going to say Ninjago City because that's, that's my favourite modern set, I think. Um Brain's gone blank about what I built in the last <laughs> year. <laughs> oh, well, it all blurs. I mean, you know, it might have been last year, it might be two years ago, I don't know. Yeah, yeah so. okay. <laughs> and do you have a favourite Lego resource, website, book, podcast, other? Uh, I do find brick sets really useful um, for keeping track of the sets I've got and uh, various bits like that. Obviously, Bricklink is useful for passing me from my money. Uh, and for just finding, oh, I just need that one piece that, to finish what I need to do. I don't often, as I said, plan things in advance electronically. So I, I, I'm more more likely to buy speculatively from Bricklink. But uh, yeah, that's that's definitely a useful resource as well. Yeah, that's always the thing. You go on a Bricklink and it's like, okay, I need these four parts, but I need to make up a bit more in the order. What do I <laughs> think I might need? <laughs> Yeah, Make yeah. the postage worth your while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we may have touched on this earlier, but a set you wish you bought but never did. Um, that one's a tricky one. Well, never did until recently would have been nine two eight. So, uh, but never, never have. I think probably the Hogwarts uh, micro scale castle because I love micro scale, but I just have not got anywhere to put it. It's massive, so. And it's, yeah. it's not just massive on the base plate, it's massive on a really awkwardly shaped base plate. So, yeah, I think that one. Yep, yep. Okay, and any AFOL groups you're part of? Yes, a proud member of the London AFOLs. Um, been a great place to go and share my love of Lego and get encouragement when I don't really need it and all that sort of thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, goaded into bunch. doing things. <laughs> yeah, lots of goading going on. Um, yeah. 
Um, but I would re definitely recommend if you can find one in your area, join a Lego user group uh, because they're they're really great places to hang out with people who of a like mind. Yeah, no, I, I highly recommend that as well. Um, and if there's anybody out there watching this video that you wish to connect with or they know a particular skill set or something, is there anyone that springs to mind? Um, I think I would probably say that I'm very well connected in terms of having an awful lot of people who are very good at different things in like a user group. I mean, so if I need to know something, I'll ask on a Slack form and somebody usually knows. So from that perspective, that's another really good reason for joining uh, a Lego user group. You'll, you'll find yourself uh, exposed to all sorts of people who've got really amazing skills that you don't have yourself, uh, and that can be really inspiring. So. And if people want to get in contact with you, how's the best way, websites, email, any of that sort of thing? Um, the, the best place to see what I'm building is uh, Blockhead UK, which is my channel on YouTube. That's all one word. Um, and... I'm on Twitter as Kaz Photo, C A Z Photo, all one word. Um, Instagram, I post tend to tend to post less too, so that's a, I'm, I'm also on there. But those two things are probably the best. Yep, yep, yeah. Instagram, you seem to be directing back to YouTube. <laughs> yeah, insurance, if uh, if co if a copper rules me, not I don't get any notifications on YouTube anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we have Twitter and Instagram instead, so. Yeah, there's, a, there's always a plan B of alerting on social media. So there's a, a close-up look at some of my habitats that I've made for various minifigures. Um, as I say, I don't collect everything from every CMF series, but just whatever takes my fancy. So we've even got something like the Patronus here from the Harry Potter set. I really like that and decided to do that as a Christmas-themed build with Santa. Yeah, that looks great. Um, I'm also trying to do some representations of classic Lego themes. So this is the, the classic airport uh, with a guy here having a, waving his little batons around to get the plane to land. And, uh, yeah, it's really I'm inventive sorry. the way that you've got the plane I'm hanging out there, the plane well. out there as well. Yeah, that's definitely not in spec, but it works. Mm. And then sometimes um, the build a minifigure has some interesting bits and pieces. So this was one of the special figures from uh, the, the local uh, build a minifigure area for Halloween. Picked up the, the costume there. Yeah, great. And this was the first, yeah, the first one I built was this um, Fox and Grain. And we've got Scooby and Shaggy running from, running from a ghost in the doorway behind them. And some of the recent ones, I haven't actually done videos on all of these yet, but uh, we've got Balthazar from the uh, Lego Movie 2. Now, I know he's a mini doll, and I don't really do mini dolls, but I really liked his, his wacky hair and the fact he's got a little body in the background there, so I decided to make him a habitat of his own. And there's various others. This is another classic theme, Emtron. Yep. yep. Um, Disco Kitty. <laughs> That's brilliant. With her lovely, lovely uh, feathered boa. And these are the habitats I made for the trolls. So I bought the troll set. I think it was called the Volcano Rock or something. Can't remember. And I, I wondered what on earth to do with the figures. And then I thought, oh, well, if I make a habitat for each of them with some of the bits that I've taken apart from the set, um, then that's a way of keeping them together. This is one I built for Easter, which is basically a little bunny rabbit. Stealing some carrots from under someone's allotment. Yeah, I think that's one of my favourite ones of yours. That's great. And then, of course, big fan of Benny here. On the moon. And Scrooge McDuck. And, uh, oh, this is one of my favourites recently. Is um, the the alien. Uh, sorry, the, the classic um, sort of Flash Gordon type uh Rocket, ra rocket Ranger, so as in his enormous cockpit with the uh, things flying. And then this one was um, one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in a sewer. That's really that well do. done. And then that's the most recent one I built, this Spider-Man. And there's a little behind. 
leaping from web to web. So there we go. Three bits left in terms of space for these. Hopefully. Yeah, that, that's it. You've got such a uh, a wide and varied design sense there, like the the ideas and the different ways and techniques you've used. It's just brilliant. Again, I find it's really um, it's a really good format because you're concentrating everything into an eight by eight square, and actually you can pack quite a lot into an eight by eight square if you do your, like this one, for instance. As I said, um, now there's an awful lot in that. But the, he's got a curved wall for all of his control panels yeah. there. Um, yeah, you're making, mummy. making every bit of studs wall space count and, you know, there's, there's nothing wasted. And then this one I did recently as well. Um, again, I say I'm not much of a DC Comics fan, but this was the Joker. <laughs> and I asked Ben from our Lego user group, What's the iconic scene that the Joker is seen doing? And he said the classic is Joker is selling poison candy floss to two kids at a fairground. And there was a, he sent me a, a script, a photograph of uh, the cartoon. And it's basically, I've, I've almost replicated the thing of, of him building, yeah. um, uh, him selling these, these candy floss to two unsuspecting little kids. So. And then, of course, don't cross Uni Kitty when she's in a bad mood, eh? Rage kitty. <laughs> exactly. And there we go. So this is my collection of brick heads so far. Um, I don't have absolutely all of them, but I've got a good new number here. Most of them are on the top shelf are the special seasonal ones. And then we've got some Star Wars and I've tried to group them in themes even if they come from different time frames. Um, on the bottom we've got DC and Comic Heroes um, and then some Disney stuff towards the side I think and then, um, and then some of these are some custom ones that I've built um, these four were ones I was talking about the dwarf characters. We've got Rimmer, Lister, Crichton, and the cat. And these big fans. Yeah, the, you, you, you can tell that that's them. Um, that's great. And this is uh, Marvin the Paranoid Android from Hitchhiker's Guide, the BBC television series, which is my, one of my favourite things growing up. There's a piece of paper for him to pick up with his massive intellect. <laughs> And then the one on the left there is myself, uh, from the Go Brick Me set, which is really, really fun. And some more Disney things down here. Back to the future. So, yes. Um, I had a, only a couple of shelves up until a few weeks ago. I bought them ages ago, and I think kept thinking, I must put those up to finally get the brick heads sorted. So that was a project for a week or two this weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, I remember when you uh, <laughs> first put that up on either Instagram or Slack. What type of shelves are they? Uh, they are Mosslander by IKEA. So M-O-S-S-L-A-N-D-A. -S and they have, in fact, got their picture, meant to put in pictures in so that you can put them on there without them falling off. Let me just see if I can show you here. So they've got a, a lip, a U-shape. Yeah. But I've decided to fill these with um, some foam core so that they're actually level with the front oh. because the habitats starters, um, stick out the, out the front. I'm just dropping something on the floor. Uh, the habitats um, stick out the front. And the other thing I did with the brick heads was I chopped up some third party base plates. Um, and so they're actually sitting on base plates, so I can move several of them at a time. Yeah, yeah, without them. It's a lot easier. I'll just take them off as a whole lot and then put them back again. Yeah, easier to manage and deal with rather than trying to f do each one one by one. Yeah. 
Thanks very much for joining us, Kaz. Such a tremendous amount of insight there and just great to see all your, your builds and get a better sense of how you approach your design and philosophy. So thanks very much for coming on. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. If you'd like to be on the show, then drop us a line at matt at mattelder.com. Otherwise, that's it from us here at Family Bricks. Until next time when we talk about all things Lego.